and welcome to the TOA 16 studio here in Berlin. My name is Robin Waters from TechU. I'm here with Dominic Richter, who is the, one of the founders and CEO of HelloFresh, and we're going to talk about his company. Welcome. Uh, Dominic, welcome to the UFO. Um, you're a Berlin native, kind of, to the startup ecosystem, and you're also a big supporter of TOA. Um, how involved are you with TOA? So I've obviously known TOA for quite some time, and um, once Nico, the basically the main man behind the organization, approached me a couple of months ago if I want to support it. I basically said uh, yes, straight from the start, because I think it's a very unique concept. It's very different to a lot of other startup conferences, and I think it's really like a very worthy case to support, and uh, I'm super happy to be here and actually see it live. Yeah, totally agree. Do you go to a lot of startup conferences, or do you typically focus on the business? I'm not so much of a conference guy, to be honest. I've uh, obviously done my fair share of conferences over the years. I think it's especially important if you, you know, want to raise funds, if you want to get your startup in front of investors, etc. But like I said, I've never seen a conference like TOA. And I think that's the kind of like unique approach that I really liked, um, having been an attendee last year and um, knowing a lot of people that have been and always told me, like, this is a very different um, conference. And that's why I think um, it's such a unique one. Um, so why don't you give us the basics? What's HelloFresh? What do you do? So the vision for HelloFresh is really to say, if you are someone who can commit to cooking at home, then we want to make it as easy and as accessible for you to actually do that. The way that it works at the moment is basically you subscribe to a plan, and then once per week we deliver a box full of pre-portioned ingredients with all the recipe cards that you need to actually cook a number of meals straight to your doorstep, and then within 30 minutes, you can basically cook nutritious and delicious meals at home. So really trying to remove all the friction, all the barriers that people might have to home cooking. Right. That makes it very convenient. Um, does it also make it convenient for everyone or is it mostly for people who can afford that kind of service? Is it an upscale business or can anyone try it? Well, like when we started out, we were, I would say, a business that catered to a very niche market because the service and the product as we had it in the beginning is very different to what we had right now. When we started out, right, it was basically us saying, we only deliver two couples, we only do three meals per week. You cannot choose or pick which kind of meals you want to have. We don't cater to different lifestyles. But over time, what we've done is really kind of like tried across different dimensions to innovate and to say, we want to be able to deliver to different uh, household sizes. We want to be able to deliver, uh, to offer you a menu of, let's say, eight meals or 10 meals per week where we, you can actually choose which ones you want to have. Um, we want to like offer it at different price points. We've introduced like a more competitive, price competitive family offering. So I think over time, you know, we've just broadened our customers, our customer segments. And I think going forward, you can also expect to see a lot more of that. So really kind of like the goal is to say, if you like home cooking, then no matter your household size, your budget restrictions or your dietary preferences, we want to be able to send you an awesome product that you love. Great. Um, are you a foodie yourself? Do you like home cooking? I'm very much a foodie myself, yeah. So I'm super interested in all the stuff that's going on. I think there's so much stuff going on right now. And also um, cooking has been like a big passion for myself. I've always been very worried about the kind of like use of ingredients and the kind of ingredients that you get when eating out, especially kind of like when going for a cheap dish or something like that. So I've always tended to cook a lot at home because I just wanted to kind of like know where does my stuff come from, right. uh, kind of wanted to have that transparency. And when we then came up with the model for HelloFresh, we basically built it around a lot of the things that we couldn't find anywhere else and where we said like, this is what, let's say, the, the consumer of the 21st century really wants. And um, yeah. So they want to know where their ingredients are coming from, um, how healthy they are, how nutritious, and how well they go together. Which and if you talk to people, I think a lot of people actually say, you know, I don't want to rely on processed foods. I don't want to kind of like um, do takeaway all the time. It's actually quite expensive to do takeaway all the time, but it's also quite hard to do home cooking if you need to run to the shop after hours or kind of like thinking about a new recipe, all of those things. Will I actually make it? All those things, will, it, will I be able to create it? How long is it gonna take me? I don't want to do that stuff like um, on a weeknight after I came home from work. And that's basically all the pain points that we wanna address one by one. Got it. 
Um, now, the business has been around for almost five years. Uh, you're in about 10 countries now. We've raised 300 million euros. Um, you're about 1,200 people now um, in terms of staff. Um, so obviously, you scaled up very quickly. Um, do you think being in Berlin has helped you do that? Or was it just a coincidence because you're based here? So we made a conscious decision to come to Berlin. I came to Berlin about five years ago um, with the firm goal I would like to start my own business. Um, always felt um, very entrepreneurial, had started businesses before. Came with my two co-founders to Berlin because we said like that's the best place to start a company. We were all like German speakers. So basically we said, you know, do we want to do it in Berlin or do we want to do it in London? We actually lived in London before, grew a little tired of London. Um, knew a lot of guys that were just starting up in Berlin and felt like this is an ecosystem that's developing, that's evolving. And within Germany, I don't think there's any other place that's kind of like close to Berlin, even in Europe, very, very few. Nice, okay. Um, do you find it increasingly hard to find talent here? Because obviously you're not the only uh, company scaling up here. There's you know, the SoundClouds and the Research Gates and the others. Um, so do you find it increasingly difficult to find talent? I actually think it's the other way around because if you're a startup, if you're very resource constrained, if you can't pay like uh, very good salaries, etc., if you, you know, can only offer like stock options, etc., then the kind of people that you can attract um, is a different kind of people than we can attract now. Now we also have a brand, we're established. It feels a lot less risky for good people um, to actually join HelloFresh, and at the same time, it still feels like there's a lot you know, to be done over the next couple of years. So it's not the kind of like end of the journey. So I think what we can offer at the moment is really to say, you know, um, great city that we're headquartered in. We can offer competitive salaries and good packages. Plus, it's really like um, an awesome company, an awesome concept that has a lot of opportunity to grow further. So I think that's really has helped us a lot in the last, let's say, 12, 18 months to attract a lot of good people to the company. And I think um, a lot uh, like we're let's say the abundance of great people that want to join us is much, much greater now than it has been like two or three years ago. Got it, okay. Um, now, you obviously want control over your own destiny as a founder. Um, you're only getting started as a company, it's relatively young. Um, but because you've raised as much investment as you have, the clock inevitably starts ticking. So what are the chances of you being acquired or, or going public in the near future? It's actually like a question that every now and then pops up and where we kind of like um, uh, have evaluated like uh, what are the opportunities out there or not, but which is not something that we're concerned with on a daily or weekly basis. In the end, I think um, we obviously want to create a great return for our investors, for ourselves, for the management, for all employees, etc., that are incentivized with stock options or, or, or set equity. But um, in the end, I would say, you know, we're basically focused on getting maximum value. We're not so much focused on getting maximum value for the next six months, but for the long run. Right. Because I think what all investors will buy in, etc., is saying like, you know, we want to be part of a large successful company. If that takes three years, five years, or eight years, that doesn't matter so much as to, um, rather than, you know, saying we want to be part of something really big and really successful. Got it, okay. Um, so your model, has it evolved over time? Do you think, with, with the whole food delivery um, ecosystem is made up of different kind of companies. Mm. You have Deliveroo uh, and Take It Easy going more upscale restaurants and bike delivery. Um, you have Delivery Hero and Just Eat doing more classical, you know, online ordering and, and, and delivery service. Um, you're more boxes like meal kit delivery um, and subscription. Do you see any consolidation in this space? Do you think you'll grow closer to each other or do you think there's room for everyone and that it's only going to grow for everyone? So I think there will certainly be, you know, as in all industry, there will certainly be businesses that go out of business, others that are successful, etc. But overall for the space, I'm really bullish on the food space because I think that a lot of new concepts that emerge make sense, are actually so much better for consumers than what they used to historically. And um, hence, I think that there is, because it's such a big category, that there is ample space for actually a lot of great companies to emerge. I'm sure that HelloFresh will be a very successful and a very good one and kind of like leading the pack. But I also think that it's not mutually exclusive to other companies operating in that food space also becoming very successful. Got it. How important is it for HelloFresh to own the entire supply chain from sourcing the ingredients to actually fulfilling and distributing to getting it delivered the last mile? How, how important is it for you to kind of own that space? Generally, we 
do think that HelloFresh and people working for HelloFresh apply the greatest care and have the greatest passion for the product. That's why when we think we can do something very well, we also want to do it ourselves because, like I said, we do think that you know somebody having instilled the HelloFresh culture, etc., will apply more care and will apply more attention to the product, to the product quality, etc., than some outsider. So from a strategic perspective, we want to own as many steps as possible of the value chain, but obviously it needs to make sense economically and it needs to be needs to make sense in terms of um, the buzzword, I guess, is opportunity costs. So where do you actually want to spend your time on? You don't want to spend your time on everything. You want to pick those areas where you can make a difference, where we can you can create a competitive edge and kind of like figuring that into the translation, uh, into the equation, then means that there is a lot of parts that we want to do ourselves, but not all of them. Got it. Um, final question, as you've scaled the company, um, you've been growing quite rapidly, what are some of the things that you've learned and what are some of the challenges you faced as you grew the company from essentially zero to 1,200 employees? I think like what we've definitely learned is that things tend to take a little longer than anticipated in the beginning, but that's you know, something that really has... Um, really has that enormous hockey stick growth curve, then it basically hits you and you can't really prepare for that. So I think that's definitely one of the lessons that you learn. You know, you come up with a plan, you start implementing that plan, and a lot of times you're like, why doesn't that work like right from the start? Why is it not like 5,000 customers coming in through the door first time? It's a great product, etc." So things take time. And in the end, it's like it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Like it does feel like a sprint in a lot of different different occasions, just because there is so many things that you need to get done till tomorrow, till end of the week, till end of the months, etc. But in the end, like you're really in it for the long run, and um, in being in it for the long run also means that the way that you treat customers, the way that you flexibilize your offer, the way that you let them customize the offer, etc. All of that, you know, needs to make sense over the long run optimizing for the next three months or the next six months, you know, at the beginning, maybe you need to do it because you don't have so much cash runway, etc. But at some point, it's really about like becoming the best brand and it's about becoming the best company for your long lasting customers. And that means having a time horizon um, over which you kind of like tend to apply certain decision making processes of three years, five years, etc. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Dominic. Um, and thank you for joining us here at the uh, TOA 16 studio here in Berlin.